Hi guys, welcome back to the Improvement Season podcast. It is me, Steve Hall, in my winter wear. And on the other end is Pascal Floor wearing the short hair. Oh, it, that rhymed. Hair, wear, hmm. and the tash is still yeah. there. I should be a poet. And it came back, kind of, you know, in a, in a very quick manner. And I'm finally also over the, the infection, which is... Oh, yeah. Uh, it's something that we haven't really touched on like last week, uh, but I'm finally off the antibiotics now. I, I actually needed to jump on antibiotics after all, which is something that I was hoping to avoid. And um, yeah, finally, finally it's gone because it's spread throughout also my beard and all that kind of stuff. And that kind of man, here's the last days. And I know this is, we don't really want to share too much details about kind of pooping and all that kind of stuff. But the last couple of days and weeks, uh, ever since I've taken the antibiotics, man, the poop is just different. <laughs> yeah, because that's one of the consequences, like you said, antibiotics just kill off all bacteria, yeah. even if it's good bacteria. Yeah. So sometimes people advise you to like buy, buy, I think it's pro or maybe it's prebiotics, yeah, one of yeah. those. Uh, but really, I, you I only did need take those. Them. I oh, did, you did take, take them. them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And also, on a side note, I am someone who's eating a lot of quark and all that kind of stuff, which should have or contain a lot of those type of things as well. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't really help, and I can really feel it still uh, that my body is getting back to being the usual self because it just <laughs> once again also yeah to maybe too it's maybe too much detail. That's why I leave it at that. It's not I, the poop that I usually have. That's yeah. So yeah, my, my digestion just like my digestion is never great during and off like gaining phases. It yeah. just as I gain, it progressively gets worse, especially in the mornings. I'm just like my body just doesn't want. I think it's one of the reasons I struggle to gain weight is because mm. the the food the body just like gets rid of the food. I'm like For God's sake, like hold on yeah. to this stuff. Don't just poop it all out. But you yeah. know, it's one of those things. Uh, but I'm glad you're over the infection because. I imagine that was not great for training, for sleep, like recovery, no. everything was just... And the funny thing is, because after the tattoo um, that I've received in, in September, uh, well, early September it was, um, I, I didn't really feel great from an energy perspective. I was feeling run down and I was more so um, attributing it to just like all of the past couple of weeks. But it was probably also being very much impacted by the infection itself because it's definitely something that the body has to deal with. And I was so it's it's funny because I was I'm always getting kind of a twitching in my in one of my eyes whenever I'm kind of either very much stressed or so. But I would also attest it to then if my immune system is maybe suppressed or maybe is working hard or so, then this is being caused as well that there's just like a poking. The entire time in my eyes, yeah. which is very annoying, by the way. And this has been the case. And also, I was just chronically so, so tired, so tired. Um, and that just like was the case over the past couple of days and weeks now. And then, uh, unfortunately, I was hoping that I could avoid it because it was, of course, a skin infection. Um, to spread it in my household or to then my family as well, which wasn't that big of a deal when it was still on my back because I was not touching my back. But once it was spreading throughout the, my face, apparently it was just too infectious that it then spread to then the other guys as well. And then we needed to go to the hospital. It's, um, I'm saying it easily because when you're a parent, this is just, uh, I don't know, second home for you, <laughs> getting to the ER. It's crazy how often you are actually going to the hospital when you have kids. And that was actually happening then on Sunday because um, on Hugo's back, it was spreading very rapidly. It was as, uh, in, a, in a matter of 24 hours, it was as big as my hand. Wow. Uh, going from nothing to like the size of my hand. And that's why we went to the hospital and they even said like, okay, Pascal, uh, if it hasn't been dissipated by now or hasn't been uh, gone by now, and you have more than three spots, you may want to consider taking antibiotics. And because, of course, Tony got it, Katie got it, Hugo got it, I was just thinking like, okay, let's do let's do a rehab for everyone in the household. Let's really take care of this. Otherwise, it will just like go in circles and spread across everyone all the time. And that's why we took pretty drastic measures here over the past one and a half weeks now. I guess everyone just 
did you just all take antibiotics and you have to <laughs> lot they were off school so and... katie katie and tony they did take a topical antibiotic so just a cream because right. it wasn't yep. really spreading as much for tony it was underneath the hair which was good because it is more like a fluid a liquid thing and it couldn't really spread because of that that much and for katie she had like, just two spots and Hugo needed to take antibiotics like um, in, like in a, in, a, in a kind of a liquid form. And myself, I needed to take some pills. Um, the unfortunate thing with this is I didn't take enough liquids the first night that I've taken antibiotics. And I wasn't even aware of that, Steve. Um, you've probably heard the saying that you need to swallow the pills with enough, enough liquids or sufficient liquids, you know. But I never it's really... It's nothing I've ever come across. Yeah, but, but it says it in, in even this prescription and all that kind of stuff, right, on how to take it. And I was never really aware of the potential consequences up until this point because I didn't take it with sufficient fluids and it sat in my esophagus for like the entire night. I was getting up in the middle of the night because I was just feeling a, a, a intra, an intrinsic pain. And it Turns out that if you don't swallow something like antibiotics and even something like pain medication, for example, ibuprofen can be something like this as well. If you don't swallow it with a sufficient amount of liquids, it will actually cause an acidic environment, which then causes a massive inflammation up to severe burns in the esophagus, which happened to me. And this came on top of then the, of the, the way that I felt with antibiotics. And I needed to then go on a soft diet. That means just more so liquidy kind of uh, nutrition over the past week because it was just too painful to swallow like bread and all that kind of stuff. So that happened for me here the last week. Damn. Yeah, I don't know if uh, antibiotics, you're, I think paracetamol and NSAIDs you take with food. I think generally they advise that, but mm. with... Uh, antibiotics is it also would they advise food maybe i don't know obviously that i guess would have the same effect in terms of making it sure it goes down yeah uh, they, they are advising it but of course because when you when you take pills antibiotics you always have a preset schedule on how far they need to be apart for me personally yeah. it was like eight hours apart and that's why i needed to take it when i get up in the morning immediately when i get up in the morning and this is not where I take any kind of food, um, but plenty of water. That's the good thing about it. But I try to minimize my liquid intake right before bedtime. Otherwise, I need to get up uh, in the middle of the night several times just to visit the toilet. And that's why I try to always minimize my liquid intake by the second half of the day. So I have lots of liquids first half of the day, and then I gradually fade it out towards the end of the day. But I needed then to take some medication right before bedtime. And this is where then kind of my fate was sealed <laughs> that I didn't really take enough. And then it was just wasn't, once again causing that acidic environment and really burning my esophagus from the inside, which is, yeah. it was a very, very painful experience, to be honest. Yeah, it's crazy because I know you were telling me that you weren't wanting to take them. And I was like, ah, oh, like I didn't experience any negative impacts when I took antibiotics. I guess there's different strains of antibiotic or different, uh, maybe certain ones are stronger versus others. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that must have been what it was because yeah, I was fortunate enough to not get anything. Yeah, I, I did take clindamycin, which is a reserve antibiotic, which is also then being used for um, MRSA, for example, so multi-resistant uh, strep to Coculus aureus, I think it is called, or whatever. Right. Um, so it is a stronger one. And when I was doing a little bit of digging, then this is also known for then an inflammation of the esophagus quite commonly. And it, I, once again, I was clueless about it, that if you don't really flush it down with sufficient amount of liquids, that it ha can, has, uh, can have such deleterious consequences. I wasn't really aware of that. And even if you're just reading through the description, it says sufficient amount of water. But yeah. it's kind of the same thing where, because my mom-in-law, she was a practitioner and she even said to me like, why, don't, why didn't you drink enough water? I did, right? But not enough so that everything comes down. And she was giving me a hard time, but this is her. <laughs> and I was just like, then they should state it a little bit more clearly of what a sufficient amount of water means. 
Because it's the same thing as training hard. What does that even mean? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Sufficient amount of water for me can be something like, I don't know, 200 milliliters, but apparently it wasn't in my case. Yeah, I would have thought if it's common where people get a burnt esophagus, then they would be like, by the way, when you consume these, drink it with lots of water, like more yeah. than you think you need, or I don't know, say 250 mils or something. So, ah, oh man, well, at least you're through the other end now and you can be back in the gym and training hard. And I guess the tattoo is fully healed now. So you finally kind of just got it set and everything. Yeah. But I can still feel that I'm tired overall. Um, oh, yeah. But it, w it will take a while before I'm then getting back to normal, I, I assume. Um, also from a digestive perspective and it's just overall well-being. But I mean, if you really think about it, it was more of a serious infection that was also then spreading. Not in the sense that it's a lethal uh, infection or so. It could potentially still be lethal, I think. I think each and every infection can be lethal if you're not careful. But a skin infection, uh, what it is that I had is... As long as you watch watch out for it and you take, I don't know, precautious measures and take a closer look at the how the skin behaves and all that kind of stuff, I don't really think that you're running risk of anything. Uh, whereas then Hugo, for example, he had a very severe reaction and that's why we immediately went to the ER just to get things checked out. And probably yeah. it was also the right call. Uh, and before this, I was just thinking, it's been ages since Pascal's been sick. Like you were regularly That's sick true. the last, yeah. like this year, apart from this, you really haven't had uh, that like true. A, as many sicknesses. Whereas I felt like, like the years prior to this, every other week would be checking in and be like, yeah, I'm ill again. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And this has probably also then to do with um, Hugo now going to school. He doesn't really have that kind of <laughs> interaction with those very small kids, which is touching everything and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's only Tony who is now in, uh, left in the kindergarten. So the exposure is half of what it was before, basically. Um, also, once again, Hugo is getting older. Tony is getting older. They um, are more aware of their own hygiene as well, of not kind of touching everything and just smearing it all over their faces. And um, they are very much... We, we try to teach them very much that they should wash their hands regularly. Because I think, personally, this is just, of course, my observational experience. Um, our society is very, very bad at hand, hand cl cleansing or kind of hygiene overall. Um, and that, that is something that we are trying to teach them. And I think that those kind of things, alongside with, of course, they getting older you don't really kiss them as much anymore as you did before you don't really you're not as close to them as you were before as well and that of course minimizes then the exposure that you can have to then certain uh, germs yeah. and bacteria and all that kind of stuff yeah that makes sense i was thinking it was related to the kids getting older so it yeah. makes sense like everything that you said there and yeah that's one of the like key ways to reduce the amount you get sick is like hand hygiene and then like not touching your face as much yeah. and wash your hands before you make food and yeah i'm i don't know who instilled it in me but i think my friends used to think i was a bit of a weirdo at school because i'd always oh, really? like before like um breaks or like lunch i'd always go to the bathroom and wash my hands yeah like it was just something i always did before i'd eat food and yeah i'm just someone if like i don't know i go to a restaurant we've come off the tube or the underground and we go in there to eat. I'm like, I'm going to the bathroom to wash my hands before I eat. Whereas Charlotte just doesn't even care. Whereas I'm like, hey, no, we've like, touched enough, so many Steve, things. Because I, I, I always thought that I'm the weirdo as well. Because I always carry a small traveling bottle of uh, disinfectant with me. Uh, because I, 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 I don't know what it is. But I very much, I don't know. I find it so disgusting to touch something where i just know that other people touch it as well yeah. especially like those poles in a uh, public transportation i don't really like to hold on to those kind of things. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i, I find it me. so disgusting this is one of the most disgusting things to me at least and it's the same for me no matter where i'm at even at home before i'm taking any kind of food in my hands i always wash my hands or disinfect them yeah I'm always like, I wish I had brought the little disinfectant bottle with me because yeah. I'm like, now I have to find a bathroom to like wash my hands. Yeah. Or Ada just randomly licks me during the day and I'm like, right, I've got to remember to wash my hands. <laughs> like there are now. so many <laughs> things like this where I'm just like, oh, I don't know, 
one of my pet peeves, and I don't know how you feel about this, Steve, is when people in public, and especially when they are workers, um, they they sneeze in their own hands, uh, in their hands, while then, I don't know, in, in the UK, you're often doing self-service checkouts at something like Tesco's, you know? Sure, yeah. But in Germany, we don't really have a lot of supermarkets where this is something that you can do. So there's still a cashier. And sometimes it's like, I don't know, they're sick. They are just like coughing into their hands or something like this. And they pick up your stuff afterwards and just put it over the counter. And I was just like, oh, God damn it. Stop it. You know? <laughs> yeah. I get you remember when I was in Germany for your wedding. I don't know. I went to a big supermarket. And I did the self-service checkout and I couldn't get out. I was like, why can't I get out? And apparently I needed the receipt to mm. scan it to get mm. out. I was like, oh, Germany are next level here. We can just like pay. I guess it's pay because some people don't and they just walk out. Uh, but, but yeah, you needed your receipt to be able to yeah, escape. Yeah, but I like that. I like <laughs> yeah, yeah, that system, sense. right? It just made it just took me off guard because I was like, oh man, I'm just that English guy yeah. who just fucking <laughs> clueless. They're like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, you you are sitting there with a beanie. You're not sick right now. No, no sickness here. And in fact, I mean, touch wood, I haven't been sick. This is going to sound like I don't know if it's a placebo or what, but I haven't been sick since I've been taking garlic uh, oil. So I take the last time I got sick, I was like, fuck, I hate getting sick. I'm going to do everything I can to avoid getting sick. So I already do the hygiene thing. So I was like, I'm going to what else can I take to avoid getting sick? Zinc, keep your zinc intake up. And then obviously just micronutrient dense foods, all the mm. stuff you generally get through your diet. But I don't really eat garlic regularly. I certainly don't eat like raw garlic clothes or cook them. I don't really use garlic that much in my day to day eating. So I was like, what can I do here? And garlic seems to have quite a potent effect on like actually helping you avoid getting sick. So yeah, I've been taking one capsule a day and I haven't been sick since. I'm not saying it's the garlic, but maybe it's helping. Well, it's got to be help. It should be helping because there's a decent number of uh, like papers supporting it. But hey, so I wouldn't yeah, no sickness. probably be attested to your overall hygiene though. I, I think don't if generally get sick much. Yeah, if you're regularly washing your hands, I think that this is one of the biggest culprits probably for the vast majority of people that they are not washing their hands uh, uh, properly and by that exposing themselves to some kind of bacteria. I don't really think that it has mostly something to do with then uh, aerosols and um, that they are then in a room where someone else is being sick or so, unless they are, of course, in a room where it's very small. They are like aerosols. Flying. Exactly. Um, but even then, it's like questionable on how much of an exposure you have then to those um, bacteria and also viruses. I think it's mostly then like hands. Yeah. So, and also I think, and part to your point with your kids, I don't interact socially a great deal day to day. Like Charlotte's mm. on the underground every day, interacts with people at work. I go to the gym, I go to a supermarket. That's most of the interaction I get. So it's not like I'm mixing with tons of people. Over the weekend, of course, like when we go into Central, like we did actually this weekend because Charlotte's parents came down. So there was much more of that. But um, yeah, my risk of exposure is probably quite less than, I don't know, some people. Yeah, no, absolutely. Steve, we have lots of things to talk about. So instead of talking about sicknesses and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> uh, let's delve into things. Because our man, James, uh, from the Natty News Daily podcast also, or just Natty News in general, um, he brought up a, an interesting topic, and that has to do with the rate of gain. Um can you summarize that really quickly, Steve, because you're always good at summarizing things a little mm -hmm. bit more, so, or you, you're not prepared for that too no, much? No, I, I did listen to James's, uh, he voice noted us over on Instagram. I listened to them and Pascal was going back and forth. I was like, I'm not going to have my voice in here All as right. well to All give right. to give more people more things to listen to. I was like, yeah. uh, like you guys are talking back and forth. I'm not, uh, but from my understanding, James was essentially saying, that he's come to this um, place where he doesn't so much push uh, an assertive surplus that he's trying to move within and he more often and doesn't use the scale as heavily as he has in the past and is more often recommending for himself and people maybe who are serious but a little less structured um, than maybe myself or he mentioned Dan Cole um, and just gets them to generally aim for maintenance or not i'm not even sure he recommends tracking and it was more so like mindfully eating and 
he has found that he likes that approach and people gain plenty of muscle well on that approach versus maybe being a bit more assertive with your rate of gain, having to go through mini cut phases um, to bring that body fat level back down. And he was kind of talking about also kind of the rate limiting factor of like muscle gain. You can only gain so fast. And so why would we push body rates, uh, body weights so quickly when you're gaining grams compared to the amount of body fat that you're gaining? And he's just unsure if that's the way to go. And it was just, he prompt wanted us to discuss that a little bit further. I don't know if I summarized that well. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that you did. And first and foremost, I just want to put out a disclaimer that I don't really think that this discussion will lead to a conclusion or anything I like. Simply because I even brought it up there in the discussion with James as well. Um, this has been a question that has been on my mind since the early days of coaching and also early days of my lifting career as well. What is an appropriate surplus? What is an appropriate rate of gain? And I still, after now having done this since 10 years and also being close to eight years of online coach, um, I still don't have an answer that satisfies me. Um, and I can't really still compare the two with another and come, come to a certain conclusion of what is better than the other. I can't. And that bugs me. I would love to have more of a conclusion for myself and more of a clear direction where to push it. And maybe maybe we just have to come to terms with that we will never really figure it out simply because it's too individualized. Um, I've seen people doing very well on more assertive um, caloric surplus. And then I've also seen the opposite of it as well. And I've... So for me personally, I've changed my recommendation of the rate of gain, what I deem as appropriate for the vast majority of people since like two, three years ago or so. And I always recommend to be somewhere in the range of 0.2 up to 0.3% of a body weight gain per week on average. This is the optimal rate of weight gain, what I would suggest for the vast majority of people. Everything above that, totally fine. Everything below that, totally fine as well. The more you deviate from that optimal range, in my opinion, the more you want to actually take a closer look at what is going on and um, whether it's still appropriate. And I've even had it with several athletes already where I uh, intentionally were below the 0.2 to 0.3% of a body weight gain um, per week mark or range. But hardly ever do I push above this intentionally. If it's above that, I'm not worried though. I try to once again also there see context and also make sense of how things are going and then compare it also maybe to previous gaining phases if we have that data available. But I never really intentionally push above the 0.3. If it's happen happening, then it's happening. But I intentionally at times take things slower because... I do believe that many people have no real business in pushing things too aggressively because so many other variables outside of their gym or outside of nutrition and gym and also inside nutrition and gym aren't really optimized to really fully take advantage of an environment like this. Yeah, I, um, I'm on the same page, actually. So, yeah, my background was... Uh, gaining way too quickly and getting fat so I did the whole like dream of bulk type yeah. of deal then for the longest time my I didn't have that surplus in place uh, you can see it between 2014 2017 the, the progress I made during that period of time just wasn't as good because I part of me was gaining too slowly but I also didn't allow my body weight to go up as high so that's part of that mm -hmm. so it's like you said you, there's so many variables that are taking place during this that you can't possibly have like a really clear answer because I don't know, your training quality improved or maybe your sleep improved or maybe it got worse or whatever it happened. So it's, it's hard to like be like, this is definitely it. Um, but I agree with you absolutely that like, I, I've kind of come to the conclusion now where I think a surplus is best for muscle growth. I have like little doubt about that, but the size of the surplus, I'm less concerned about. It more so needs to be not too big <laughs> and it just needs to be a surplus and then just falling within a reasonable range where it's almost like hey it just needs to be an amount that's trackable if we can't track it then you might as well be at maintenance and i do want you in a surplus it just doesn't want to be too big so i used to maybe try and 
maybe it's a couple of weeks or a week had gone by, maybe a couple of weeks. Someone's maintaining weight. Whereas now in the past, I might have moved food up. Whereas now I'm like, hey, I'm just going to leave it a little bit longer and see what happens over this next week. Because it's such you're trying to track such a slow thing. And I don't want someone to maintain for a whole month. And I doubt that's going to happen if you have more data behind you that's kind of seen them gaining on this intake. And yeah, that's kind of where I've come to as well. And out of interest, the uh, the recent paper that came out, and there's really little research on kind of surpluses, but the one with Eric Helms, it was done for seven weeks. And they had either maintenance, 5% surplus or a 15% surplus. Very interestingly, the people at 5% surplus just ended up at the 15% surplus anyway. So you, it was it was comparing basically maintenance to a 15% surplus. So it was like that being too precise, I, I want people to avoid being too precise. And so I like the ranges. So it's similar to what you said. This might be optimum where we're gaining at like a 0.25% of body weight per week. But if it's a bit above, that's okay. If it's a bit below, that's also okay. Just like this is the target that we're going for. No, I very much like that. And apparently we are more so in line with another than I thought or assumed and expected because I even said to James, I assume that you are more on the aggressive side. So aggressive in quotation marks, right? If we compare our two approaches with another and I'm more so conservative when it comes to this, but it seems like we are more so on the same page here than I anticipated. And also on that note, when it comes to a surplus, it's exactly like you said, I always just want to make sure that that individual is in a net positive environment when it comes to the net energy balance. I don't really care of whether it is then 100 calories on a surplus or three or 400 calories on a surplus. As long as we are not gaining way too fast and we are not seeing a steady decrease in um, in scale weight behavior, for example, then I'm totally fine with that. Because as long as you're putting yourself in, into that net positive environment, that's all that really matters. It's kind of like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an, a, a proper... Um, proper analogy the only thing that i can think of is once again the sun exposure one um it doesn't really matter whether you are then exposing yourself to like super bright daylight if you want to get a tan or like just um being out on a 20 degrees day or so the sun is shining if you're exposing yourself long enough to sunlight then you probably get a tan at some point you know it's kind of the same here as well um you don't really want to risk being too long in very, very bright and hot daylight because then you are running risk of kind of um, burning yourself, not getting the most beautiful tan and stuff like this, right? Causing deleterious um, things to your health overall. It's kind of the analogy of like gaining too quickly. But if you're spending enough time in that net positive environment, you will get a tan after all, right? But if the sun isn't shining at all, you're never really seeing daylight, you would probably not get a tan as well. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you as well. And I think that's a case of, hey, if you go, if you're a little bit faster than where we're suggesting that 0.25, then you maybe gain fat a little bit quicker, but you also gain maybe a little bit more muscle and you have to cut sooner. But in the other scenario, if they're gaining a little bit slower than that, they can gain for longer and they don't have to do that cut. So like in the end, they kind of, they're about the same place. But if one person's just maintaining, they might not really be gaining very much, if at all. And I do always come to this argument where people talk about recomposition, which like, I'm not even going to argue against it. It definitely happens. We've seen it within research. Whether or not it happens to every individual, I don't know. But it also comes down to what you mentioned at the start there is environment. If someone's environment is not set up well for muscle gain in terms of their sleep, their quality of training, like their nutrition, all of those factors that go into maximizing muscle growth, if then like you put them at maintenance, well, they're not going to gain anything. If you put in a surplus, they might gain a little bit of muscle and like a, a bit of fat. But if you optimize all of that and you keep them at maintenance, then yeah, maybe they're going to gain some muscle. But if you just gave them a small surplus, they're going to gain much more in that scenario, a significant amount more where I'm like, that should probably be the goal. Yeah, absolutely. And um, let's take a quick break and then be back at this topic another time. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with a plan? Then 
it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We created the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. So the way that you, we could also there put it is kind of like school grade system. You have all of those variables. You have like a school grade system, let's say, I don't know, how is it in, in the UK? Is it like A, B, C, D? What is it? At least 1 to it was 15? when I was there. Okay, in, in Denmark, it was like 1 to 15, for example, where 15 okay. is the best, for example. You know, it's kind of A plus or A plus plus for American. Um, this is kind of how our system goes too. All right, uh, so let, let's stick with this one then. So you have different lessons, of course, where then you have a different type of grade because of your performance. It's kind of the same there as well. You have different classes or different lessons and you try your very best to maybe optimize things and get the most or the, the highest rating and the highest grade. If you don't, have you really then deserved of going to the best university, for example? Probably not. You didn't really qualify for it because you didn't really do what is necessary in order to get there. It's kind of the same there as well for being more aggressive around than the surplus. If you really want to be aggressive with the surplus, then you want to also put yourself in an environment where you can take advantage of it. I don't really see the point in having a massive surplus if you can still optimize on so many other fronts, because it just makes it redundant then to be so aggressive and, and push the calories that high. What do you think about this, Steve? Yeah, I think it it makes it... Um... Because, yeah, you could argue it's similar. Actually, a, a similar argument is surrounding supplementation. If like your diet is dog shit and you're trying to supplement, why bother with the supplements when you have such easy, low hanging fruit to take care of? But you could say, well, it's better than nothing, right? Having some of these supplements is still going to help to a very small extent. So I would say similar here, like the surplus is still probably going to help make a really shitty situation slightly better. Oh, what happened what, there? What, <laughs> what the hell happened? What did you do, Steve? <laughs> Why am I frozen with a thumbs up? I don't know. Can I thumbs up again? What's it doing? I'm so confused. Did Maybe you do I'll it on your end? Camera. I didn't press anything. I didn't do anything either. <laughs> I went like, did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> that was so weird. Me. I'm so lost. That was really off-putting. I hope that doesn't happen in another yeah. podcast uh, where I'm interviewing someone. So yeah, basically... Uh, it allows you to, like a slightly better result from a really si shitty situation, but that isn't where I would head. I definitely try and sort out all these other variables before that one. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely with you. I th I also think because I've been I'm thinking more so about it when James brought up the topic because I haven't really given it a thought in a long time. And what I've been thinking, and maybe I'm completely wrong here because you could also very easily make a counter argument for it, uh, is the more experience you get, the more you, of course, learn also how to lift properly. This is also then the time where it may be recommended that if you are playing with the thought of jumping on something like anabolic steroids, then is the time. Because you have learned to eat well, you've learned to train properly, and also you have uh, taken care of something like proper fatigue management. And we can maybe also then apply to something like a surplus that if you have all your ducks in a row, then maybe it is also a good idea to be a little bit more aggressive because you're also coming to the point where it's not as easy to build muscle mass anymore. And you can get away with it knowing that the time and effort that you're putting in is also very much rewarding with a proper return. Whereas yeah. when you're a new beginner, for example, you do a lot of dumb shit. You don't really expose yourself to the highest amount of hypertrophic stimulus and all that kind of stuff. As you can tell already by that argument that I've brought up, now 
you could make the counter argument that if you are a beginner though, then you have a high susceptibility of building muscle mass. So why not be aggressive in an environment like this? But to me personally, that argument isn't strong enough to make then a proper fundamental argument of just being aggressive around the, the surplus because we also know that you can build then in an environment like this proper muscle mass without having all ducks in a row. So why would you then push yourself into that boat or that direction? Probably the situation it would make sense is if someone's really skinny. Like yeah, they have like very true. little body fat on them. I think if you have plenty of body fat, your argument holds so well because people are just going to see the best of both worlds at that point. Whereas, don't know, me back in the day when I started, I was skinny as anything. So like I just had nothing. <laughs> I, I still gained muscle without uh, really doing anything proper with my nutrition, which everyone will. But I think I probably hit a wall sooner than other people might who were maybe a slightly kind of softer in that scenario. But again, if like to James's point, if people like eat for performance and they fuel themselves properly and they eat like, I don't know, over their appetite a little bit, they're probably going to put themselves in a pretty good spot there anyway. But you did bring up a good point in terms of something that is often talked about is level of advancement and adjusting a rate of gain given someone's level of advancement. So obviously more novice, generally people advise a faster rate of gain, more advanced, slower. Do you differentiate your rate of gain based off someone's like training history or level of advancement? At first, I would say no, but now that I've been thinking about it a little bit more deeply, I think the answer should be more so a yes because of the things that I've just talked about. Those people who have been training for longer, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, um, know how to push themselves better, know how to train themselves in a more effective and more efficient way. By that, putting themselves in a more advantageous spot if they are then a little bit more aggressive with the deficit and also you can trust that everything outside of the gym is most of the time also more or so optimized for muscle building now a caveat here though um, i also know of many many professionals um, that professionals more so in the sense of personal trainers for example who really don't have it nailed down when i take a look at their nutrition uh, take a look at the training and all that kind of stuff. They are falling very much into a hole of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Because they are professionals and they are teaching other people on how to do things, they know themselves what it is that they are talking about. When you then have a look over what it is that they are actually doing, sometimes you're actually shocked. I can't really put it in a, a nicer manner. Um, sometimes I'm... Yeah, go I was going to say, we've all seen those PTs in the gym where you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, yeah. what are they doing? <laughs> and that, that is not to bash other people, right? Um, because when I look back, there have been plenty of things that I did in the past that I was also very much convinced of that were right, but I didn't, or I lacked the experience, I lacked the knowledge to really critically analyze myself, reflect on what it is that I'm doing, and then adjust properly. Now it's easy to say this, looking back in hindsight, but um, experience isn't directly correlated with doing things correctly mm -hmm. and doing things the right way and having things figured out. It increases maybe the likelihood that this is the case, um, but it isn't one, once again directly correlated with another. That being said though, um, if I think when it comes to especially then training performance, once again, um, you could make the argument for it, but I think it's more on an individual case by case basis. What's the personality type? What, what are their goals? Um, what is it that they have done in the past? Because I've also worked with people, of course, who have finally managed to reduce their body fat levels. And they are sick and tired of those constant cutting and gaining cycles. And if someone is in that situation or they are getting older, maybe they are now in their mid-40s and they simply don't really want to go through those phases because they don't really see the point in it anymore. And they just want to maintain a nice looking physique then it makes sense to put them uh, around, roughly around maintenance, but also there, even when I put people on maintenance, I always like to ensure and say to them, I want you to still end up in a net positive environment. 
And even if that means that we are then in the range of like, I don't know, 100 calories of surplus and see that the body weight is very gradually increasing over the time span of several months, but so slow that we can barely detect it, but still making sure that we are in that net positive environment rather than a net negative environment. And I think the point that we're, you've made several times really well is that nutrition is only permissive of what you're doing with your training as in, and I say this all the time, training is the match that lights the fire for muscle gain. Like nutrition is just the fuel that you're putting within that. So if your training isn't in a good place to create a demand for muscle growth, it doesn't matter how you eat. You're as someone who's been training any period of time, you're not going to be gaining muscle. And so I actually had this point in my head to bring up was that I actually think a surplus for muscle gain could almost be overrated and that training is underrated. Mm. A surplus is very helpful, I think, for muscle gain, but training, I think people discount it. They think, oh, my, my training's in a good spot. I just need to get my nutrition in check. But I think a lot of people need to get their training in check, uh, make sure it's high quality, and then come to the nutritional component like afterwards, maybe. So I think training is underrated, probably more so, but that could mean that surplus is overrated. No, totally. I've never really thought about it this way. And I think that you have a very, very solid point here. It's kind of the same when it is that you've talked about pre-workouts and also then sure. the negative aspects that many people don't really think about. And I think that this is one of those things that many people don't have on their radar, me, myself included. I've never really thought about it this way, that people put too much emphasis on the caloric surplus rather than the quality and the output of their performance. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I'm so big on, like in the past, maybe it wasn't the fact that I was gaining so slowly that meant I didn't gain that much muscle. Maybe it was because I was at a body composition that was too lean to perform my best in the gym. And maybe if I had had the same nutritional setup but been 10 pounds heavier with a bit more body fat, I could have had so much better performance in the gym that then I'd have gained more muscle. And yeah. I think the big difference between 2017 to 2021, where I gained um, maybe close to 10 pounds of lean mass, was training was really the key variable. And just most of the time being in a surplus. Uh, and that, again, that's like the goal for everyone is if you want to gain as much muscle as possible, be in a surplus for as long as possible. That's just being in that net positive environment, like you said. And if you rush that surplus, then you're going to be cutting all the time and that's going to be setting you backwards potentially. So that's where this is like this kind of sweet spot. It's more of a range of like gaining where you can maximize the time you're in there, but you're not spinning your wheels at periods of time either. That brings me to kind of still a conclusion though, which I didn't really expect overall. And it's nothing groundbreaking. It's nothing new or so, but it brings, it, it, definitely brings new perspectives for myself as a trainee but also then as a coach of how to probably approach it in then the future and once again it's not that most people didn't know about it it's more like now having it summarized and then making sense of things because before that it was kind of like a mind map all over the place and now we are collecting it into a, a, a bunch of system you know where it's like you definitely don't want to uh, gain too fast because there's little advantage to it most of the time. Um, when it comes to the surplus itself, actually it doesn't really matter as long as you're in a specific range that varies from uh, being slightly above maintenance to then maybe a rate of gain of 0 0.5. Everything above that is probably once again counterproductive overall and you're just gaining way too much fat in a short period of time. And then instead of focusing so much on the rate of gain itself and also then the surplus of how many calories in a surplus you may be in uh, because the study that you've brought up of those individuals who thought that they are eating around five percent of a main uh, of, of a surplus ended up at 15 percent still just shows that thinking about it is more of a futile thing and it just probably takes away some of the focus some of the energy resources which are then better spent in just focusing solely on performance and optimizing your training and trying your very best to really increase things in the gym. Because as we already stated in the past, when your repetitions or the, the performance in general, but repetitions and also um, loading on the barbell goes up without a massive deviation in form and technique, maybe the form and technique is even getting better alongside with it, there's a very, very high likelihood that you are building muscle mass in the process. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really well summarized. 
The only thing I would um, add to this discussion, just in case people uh, get to thinking this way, is the thing I would encourage people not to do is like purposely hold themselves back. It comes down to a infographic I recently posted. It was basically like reframing your mind where people think about, oh, I'm advanced or I've been training many years, so I'm not going to gain much muscle. So I should try and like limit fat gain during this process. And I really want to flip people's mindset and be like, no, try and gain as much muscle as possible, which ultimately comes down to training first and foremost. And then nutrition is just permissive after that. But I don't want people to think, oh, I can only gain one pound of muscle a year. So I aim to gain one pound over the whole year. Like this is, that's yeah. like, that's, uh, you're, you're not going to get anywhere quickly with that kind of mindset. Uh, we're not kind of to that point. We do want people slowly gaining weight, essentially. Is, that's the only thing I bring people to because, yeah, yeah. I, th I think if I approach my year like that and I'm like, I'm 190 pounds, I'll try and gain to 191 <laughs> across a year. Man, not much would be happening in that year. <laughs> yeah. And also the thing is, though, um, you don't. So this is just based on my experience. And I'm, of course, biased with that, but also based on the experience that I had with athletes. Very rarely do people feel very comfortable in being too aggressive with the surplus that they own. Sure, you have sometimes the people who um, glamorize it a little bit, especially like back six, seven, eight years ago with Go Mad and Dreamer Bug and all that kind of stuff that was still the case. But nowadays, people don't really feel that comfortable in pushing their body fat up very quickly, very aggressively or just the body weight in general up very quickly, very aggressively. Um, and you can still look like you lift nearly year round, um, still see the performance going up, still building muscle mass in the process, not deviating too much maybe from your stage weight when you are like massively deviating from a stage weight when you are a competitive athlete as well, and still reaping all of the rewards alongside that. And doesn't that sound like a much, much better idea instead of being overly aggressive, feeling uncomfortable in your skin, um, maybe being sick as well at times because you're pushing food up too much and being just dogmatic and neurotic and all that kind of stuff. If you really compare it to another, it just makes sense to... And maybe this is the wrong terminology, a conservative approach, because maybe it's just a moderate and, and appropriate approach rather than conservative. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And the saying I come to is like, you can't force feed muscle gain. Like yeah. people try and force feed muscle gain. No, you can force feed fat gain. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's what something sure. you can do. You can't force feed muscle gain. And that's actually something I've uh, changed this. Like literally it was just this past mini cut I did and I came out. I just slowed down my increases in food. Mm. At this point, I'd normally be up at 4,000 calories, but I've just kept it a bit slower. I'm at 3,800 and I'm fine seeing my weight creep up more slowly and just be confident I'm eating plenty and I'm just in a smaller surplus and I feel fantastic in the gym performance is going well because a, like this is a I guess niche context is me if I end up going a bit more assertive which I used to in the past aiming more close to that 0.5 percent each week my appetite hits a wall quickly Whereas I'm like, hey, if I can gain a bit slower, be in a smaller surplus, maybe I can actually milk this out for longer and not have those appetite issues. So there's, again, like individuals, uh, kind of different scenarios, but it's another pro to be a little less assertive, at least for mm -hmm. someone to, people who hit our appetite wall quickly. No, absolutely. I think that covers it. I don't really have anything more to talk about on that front. Steve, do you? Or do you have anything else to add? Uh... No, not really. I think we covered everything that I kind of was thinking about to have for that topic. Um, I can, I have some news. All right. It's not very big news. I just like to say it uh, because I think it's one, good promotion for our coaching. Uh, two, it's good to shout out clients and yeah, I'm proud of them. So I had four competitors this weekend. I want to give them all a shout out. So I actually had um, Ferry and Dean who were in the Netherlands competing at the same show stupid me didn't realize they're at the same show because i would have tried to get them to a cut i didn't realize till i saw the photos um it's because it's a federation i'm not familiar with and dean qualified for it late these are my excuses uh but dean's first show of the season he came third which is fantastic ferry unfortunately didn't place but it was a very competitive category he'd already done a show two weeks prior and came third i believe uh, maybe second second or third in that show i'm sorry ferry if i got that wrong and downgraded uh where you placed and then i had samal who came second 
arguably maybe should have come first. The guy who came first in his category won his pro card, so that's kind of gutting in some ways, but very, very competitive showing for him. And I said four, didn't I? Oh, Mike, of course, Mike Chalice. <laughs> <laughs> Always forgot about Mike. So who's the last guy uh, who was at the MPA finals? And he yeah. came fourth in the, I think it was short, or lightweight I can't remember if it was by height I think it was by weight uh, which was very competitive and I think having seen who came first it must have been really competitive between the top like four there so fourth for his first British finals is uh, I mean that I, I didn't achieve that till last year so yeah. yeah he's done well there and then I've got Mike and Rob this weekend at the UK FBA finals which I'll be at and then we've also got uh, Simao's final show with the Evo which Evo Classic, is that what it's called? This huge yeah. German show. I didn't yeah. realize how huge it is. Like it's a massive deal. It, is. it looks like it's bigger than any UK final that we have. Yeah, it is. So yeah, cool. yeah anyway. That was Congrats, guys. Congrats, Steve, to you as well uh, on a very successful season as it appears, especially considering that the competitiveness in especially Europe and especially WMBF and all those kind of shows, right, is insane. Insane. Um, this is not to toot our horn in Europe, um, because I believe that there are plenty of other shows in the US, not just believe, I know that there are also very, very competitive shows in the US, for example, as well. Um, but the standard nowadays is just, it's crazy. It is yeah. very crazy. And then placing that well in highly competitive shows, something that it can't really compare to how it was five years ago, for example, even. Yeah. Yeah, I think we discussed not that long ago, like the people who are winning UK finals, uh, British finals, they're not placing at qualifiers. It's kind of like, hey, this is how far the sport has come, yeah. which makes me really nervous <laughs> for next year, uh, assuming I compete. Just like the caliber of athlete is just getting hugely high. And Spain in particular, which is where Samal was, the Spain, like they have crazy athletes. Spain, Germany. Uh, England, I think we have some of the like craziest yeah. athletes, probably some other places across Europe too, but like everyone's just getting wild. I just don't understand it. I'm like, what, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> cool. Then we leave it here, Steve. Let's leave it here. I think it's a good time to leave it here. Especially, I wanted to bring up something else, um, but this is something that I'm going to say for the next week. Okay. Yeah, I'm cool. game for it. Cool. Nice. Guys, then, thank you for being yeah. here. Yeah, thank I want you to hear very your much. opinions on the uh, the rate of gain, how fast you like to gain, what's been your experience with clients, if you're a coach or yourself. That'd be interesting to hear about. And like Pascal always rightly says, we very much appreciate you commenting, sharing, subscribing. We're reading now, all of the we're comments. We've 40,000 comments the now. Yeah. Co comments? Uh, subscribers. subscribers. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for all of the subscribers. If you haven't subscribed yet, and please do that. Go ahead. And also, uh, we are reading all of the comments. Um, sometimes we may not immediately get back to all of the comments, but we are trying our very best. But just know this. We see them. We read them. We appreciate them. I need to do... It's been a bit since I've had the time to do like a comment sweep if that makes sense yeah, yeah. Uh, so i will get to it <laughs> it just cool. takes me <laughs> some time sometimes it's been perfect. busy with all the competitors <laughs> yeah absolutely perfect guys thank you very much for tuning in and i guess i speak what well, we speak to you guys next week cheers, cheers guys Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.